comes from 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 17. This is the message that the Lord has laid on Mr. Benefield's heart. So let's listen to the words and uh, let them sink into our minds and into our hearts as he delivers the message shortly this morning. Verse 17 says, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Good morning. Elijah! 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 Cup's still sitting there, guys. Hey, can y'all do me a favor? Today I want you to watch this cup, because if it moves, it'll be the most exciting event of our lives. So make sure we watch this cup, right? What are we watching? Okay, because I can't read and watch the cup. That's the problem here, because if I read, I can't watch the cup. Make sure, what are we watching? The cup. Let me finish this thought. 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to skip to the end and cover that, and then we'll go back to the middle. Don't forget, what are we watching? Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. We start with this, but the focus is this. Paul addresses the negative. In communion, because they had gotten so far away from waiting for the cup to move. It's not even something we even teach anymore, is that we were waiting for the cup to move. At the end of every Passover feast, you have the children sit down and stare at a cup. They just wait for it to move. They're waiting for Elijah to pick up that cup. So that the final fulfillment of Exodus can be finished. Because God gave us five promises in Exodus. He said, I will take you out of Egypt. I will deliver you from the Egyptian slavery. I will redeem you with a demonstration of my power. And I will require you as a nation. That's four cups. And there was a fifth one. And all these cups could be picked up. They themselves walked out of Egypt. They walked through the river. They trusted God. They fought for a nation. And then there was a fifth cup and no one could touch it, so they waited on God to move it himself. So the children sit at the end of Passover and they stare at this cup, and this cup is a cup that no one can drink. And they sit there and they're waiting for someone who can pick up that cup. They're waiting for someone because only the divine, perfect one can completely create the kingdom. The kingdom that we call the church. They were waiting for this to come and staring at a cup. First Corinthians 11. Verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. 
that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. Also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's, there's different accounts of this in Matthew and Mark. And there, Matthew, you know, he's got a okay length. And then Mark, he's got very little because he's Mark. He likes to shorten everything. But then Luke goes into this weird detail because he's not a Jew. Luke says something that some of us get confused because we always say the bread and then the cup. And if you read the story of Luke, there's a problem. Or at least there's proposed a problem. But it's not real. In Luke 22, I want you to go with me so you trust me that it's really there. Because I didn't write this. Make sure you know it didn't come from me. Luke 22. We want to read the account of the Lord's Supper. Starting in verse 17. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of one who betrays me is with me on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. <laughs> the story doesn't make sense because most of us assume that in communion there was one cup. And from reading Matthew, because he's a Jew, he already knows about the four of the cups. But Mark's not. Mark's like us. Luke, sorry. Luke is like us. He's a Gentile. He's a Gentile like us who is just looking on these things and he's, they're not his customs. And he's trying to explain them to all future generations. And so he says something that doesn't make sense to us, that he took the cup and shared it. Then he broke the bread and said, this is my body. And then after they had supped, after they had finished supper, he took the cup. Now you think about it, anytime you're eating or drinking, you're having supper, right? You know, whether you've stopped, you, you already ate the steak, and now you're, you know, you're drinking your Kool-Aid, right? You're still having supper. But what happened at the end of the Passover feast was they had a cup and everybody just stared at it. Because no one could touch it. They looked at that cup and they waited for God to move. They, they waited for thousands of years for that cup to move itself. And at the end of every meal, they sat there and stared at a full cup. And it was not part of supper because no one could touch it, so no one was going to drink it. And they said, where is Elijah? And we know that Elijah came, and they did to him whatever they wanted. And the disciples knew this was John the Baptist. But they spent so long waiting for the final fulfillment of God's promise. He, he not only promised that he would liberate them from the exodus, he promised them something. He promised them a kingdom. They never got it. Never has the full nation of Israel been revealed. Never. The prophets tell us that they had chariots of steel. They never got that promise. They know, we know that the Israel was so wicked that it was taken from them. 
And that at no time did Israel ever have everything that was promised to them. Their full kingdom never came. And they always taught that Elijah one day would come and that when Elijah comes, the kingdom will be here. And so when he finished that meal, Christ not only looked at the cup, but he picks up the cup. Jesus himself, because only God could pick up this cup. Only God could pick up the cup. And what did he say? This is the covenant in my blood. He is declaring himself at once the Messiah and the Savior of the world because he picked up the cup. And then he declared that he would give it to everyone. That he would offer the kingdom in a cup of his blood. When they are waiting for an army, he is coming offering a sacrifice of blood. He is coming and declaring that he is what they've waited for. And if you read the accounts in the other books, you find out that at the end of Passover, they did something a little different. They did it every time, though. They sang a hallelujah song. They sang a song of joy. And after he had taken this cup that they had waited so long to see moved, how great would that song have been? Do you imagine waiting for hundreds and hundreds of years just for a cup to move? And, and this is what you would do. You would come to the end of it and you would sit there and stare at a cup. And all they were waiting for was for the Messiah to come and give them their kingdom. And, and they had gotten so far away from that in Corinth that they were worried about all the stupid junk. And it, and it doesn't become the cup anymore. It becomes, you know, is it one cup, two cup, three cup, four? Flip cup? Oh, wait, is it, you know, crackers? Is it a giant loaf? Is it have to be bitter herbs? Is there no bitter herbs? Is there herbs at all? And Corinth, they had gotten so far away from it that they were actually just partaking of it like a meal. And it was just, uh, include this in the meal. It doesn't even matter. And they had missed the cup. We do this every Sunday, and there are so many outside the church that tell us if we did that, it would become commonplace. And there's real risk of that. Anything that we do repeatedly could become commonplace. And we have to fight that it never becomes commonplace. Because when we take that cup, do, do we realize that that cup and it's not a matter that there's one cup. It matters which cup it was. It matters that this is the cup where God says, my kingdom, you can drink of it. You are now sons and daughters of the kingdom. You are the children of the king. Now we understand why they sing the hallelujah song. Now we understand after communion, we should look like this. Ah, it should hurt a little bit. You're like, okay, my teeth are hurting. Because we we're so excited. He just said I can have his cup. In the olden days, you knew that you had the king's pleasure if he offered you a cup. And, and Christ has all these images and God always says it. He says, come and dine with me. Come to the feast. You are one who gets a cup. And God loves us so much that he not only offers us a cup that cost him nothing. When a king offered you a cup, it cost him nothing. He had so much, he didn't care about a cup. But when Christ offered us a cup, it cost him everything. He didn't offer us a cup that was a great challenge and the cup is so important. It was the fact that he offered his blood and that cup cost him everything. It cost him everything to give us the kingdom. And he offered to it freely. 
He offers it to us for simply calling him our king. He offers us this. When we call him Lord, he allows us to be his servants as part of his kingdom. Romans 3 puts it this way. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. He offers all of us today to drink his blood, to be part of his kingdom. And just the same way this is an image, so is it the image that gets us into him. Ha having believed in him and calling him Lord, he is willing to be our Lord if we will call him our Lord. Having repented of our sins so that he can make us holy in his kingdom. Being buried with him in baptism so that same image of death brings us to life. So that we can live for him as his children and have that blood that cleanses us and he finally calls us his sons and his daughters. If there's anyone who has never been united with Christ, we offer this invitation. If there's anybody who needs prayers or wishes to submit to the eldership here, we ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing.